you guys, it's the second P. Today I'm going to be talking about how to do an initial assessment in outpatient psychiatry. These are some of the tips that I've learned along the way. And you know, these are from previous psychiatrists, previous psych nurse practitioners when I was a student and I took a lot of things from them and I incorporated into my own practice. So hopefully I can give you some of the tips that I've learned and you guys can use it in your practice. Alright guys, let's get to it. Alright guys, I want to go down the list on how to do an initial assessment. The first part is really to introduce yourself. You know, my name is a psych P. You want to dis discuss confidentiality. You want to understand what made them come in today and what are their goals for treatment and what, are, what do they think they can achieve by seeing you. And you can hopefully kind of educate them on how you can help them. So before I get to the main part of the assessment, I want to do a little bit, I always say let's do some housekeeping and we kind of backtrack a little bit. I want to learn more about their psych med history. I want to know really every medication they've been on, their reactions to it, any side effects, when were they on the medication, what dose. Uh, sometimes a lot of the primary care providers will not titrate the medication correctly. And sometimes, you know, they, the patient might have been on Lexapro 10 milligrams and they never increased it, but it was working initially. And maybe the PCP didn't increase it. Uh, there are so many things that can happen. So the psych med history is really like almost like your bread and butter. You want to know their whole, their whole timeline of what they've been on. I spend majority of my time on the psych med history. I look at their past medical history. I want to know if they have like hypothyroidism or, or HIV, low testosterone, anything that can be contributory to any you know, mental illness. Maybe they have some pain. These are things that can cause a lot of things. And I want to look at their family history. I want to know about anybody in their family that has some sort of mental health issue. And these are the main things I look at. Some of the small things I try to you know, focus on a little bit more before I get into the main assessment. All right, so this is going to be the history of present illness. This is the main portion of your assessment and you want to make this as detailed as possible. So I will ask the patient, you know, can you tell me a little bit about your childhood and how it progressed to the, your current situation? You want to know every little thing about them that could be significant. Did they have a head injury? Was there abuse or a trauma in their childhood? Parental divorce, bullying, you know, or did something, or, or were you all, you know, were they doing okay for a long time and, and more recently something like something traumatic happened? And you know, there, there's so many things that could happen from their childhood to their current state that it, there's so many factors. Um, so once I finish that out and they help me out and with their information and you get the big picture of their patient, I'll, I'll use this scaling system that I use that rates symptoms. And I learned this from some of the other previous psychiatrists that I was a student under. And they would tell me, so, so if you had to reach your mood for me, zero being really sad and depressed, 10 being as happy as you can be, what would you rate in general these last, these last several months? And they'd give me a number, so zero being really sad and depressed, 10 being as happy as you can be. It would give me an idea of where they're at currently and, and kind of getting an understanding of their baseline. And then I'd go to anxiety, zero being no anxiety at all, 10 being you can't even leave the house. And that would help me rate their anxiety. And hopefully when I would see them next time, we could get that down. I would ask about panic attacks. You know, how many panic attacks do you have a week? Or do you have any at all? And then if they do say that they have a panic, panic attack, I want to ask them, you know, this panic attack, can you, can you describe it for me? You, know, you want to understand, do they really have a panic attack? Do they, and maybe they do, but you really want to make sure they're really having a panic attack. I'll be like, does it feel like you have an elephant on your chest? Is that, you know, those are the main, you know, some of the main symptoms. Um, then I'll talk about irritability. I'll say zero being no irritability at all. 10 being you want to rip everybody's head off. And then sometimes they chuckle, you know, however it may be, but you have a baseline of, of where they're at, you know, do, do they get irritated quickly? Are they a short fuse? Um, and then I'll go to mood swings, you know, periods of feeling really happy and then really sad. Sometimes I'll say if there's a trigger or is there no trigger. Um, and some people will say sometimes it's, it's situational and that's that's normal. But it's all about emotional regulation. You know how if something bad happens to you, do you catastrophize and you get down? To, you know you just get down in terrible mood or does it is it is, is it a small decrease in mood? You look at that. I'll ask them about their sleep. You know how much sleep are you getting at night? They'll tell me six to eight hours, ten hours, no sleep at all. 
if they're saying they're not, not sleeping, I'll think about some bipolar disorder, but there's there's so many different things you're really looking at and you've already got some information earlier from uh, when they're talking about their childhood to their current state. Um, if they have issues with sleep, are they having issues falling asleep or staying asleep? And this is when you could look at different medications like trazodone or a longer acting, or maybe they don't even need one of these medications. Maybe they just need better sleep hygiene, keep their phone away uh, and, and leave it away the last hour before you're about to fall asleep. Um, maybe you're exercising at night. Um, I look at energy. You know, I'll ask them, can you reach energy? Poor, fair, and good. I want to see their energy, their overall energy level throughout the day. And how much caffeine are they drinking? Are they, are they taking four cups of coffee a day? You know, they, generally they say 300 milligrams is, is the good number and that, you know, they're doing four cups of coffee. That could be causing them to, to get wired. And also, could cause them to be, become very tired. We look at concentration. I just say poor, very good. I want to see how is their overall concentration. You know, de depression can cause poor concentration. There's so many things that can cause poor concentration. Do they have ADHD? Uh, there's a lot of things. Uh, look at appetite. Can you eat your appetite for me? Poor, very good. I want to see how their appetite's been. Have they been gaining weight recently? Have they lost weight recently? There's so many things you can learn about their appetite that can help you with your assessment. And then I'll be like, can you tell me two or three things that you enjoy? And with this, I want to know, you know, do they, do they, do they enjoy things still? You know, this is, do they have anhedonia and not enjoy anything? That's, that's, you know, I'll ask, can you just tell me two or three things you enjoy? And, and sometimes patients won't tell me anything. Sometimes people will, will laugh and, and still say something, but you know, if they don't say anything, then you know they're, there's a high, high chance they have depression or another disorder. Then, I'll, then now I'll, I'll talk, the, talk about the topic of suicide or hurting others, hearing voices or seeing things, or any thoughts of guilt and worthlessness. You don't want to you know, get into this right away. You want to kind of talk about some other things before you get into it. And then I'll talk about like any compulsions or phobias, any skin picking or hair pulling, binging or purging, restricting calories. And then we'll talk about tobacco use, any alcohol use or any illicit drug use. These are all things that can con contribute to any disorder. We also have like the, our, our screening tools. We have the PHQ-9, which is testing for depression. We have a GAD-7, which is testing for anxiety. We look at bipolar disorder and ADHD screening. So these are things that'll also fill out during the assessment. But if, after all this information that I get and looking at their psych med history, I look at their family history, which is very important. Um, I want to see if they have like if, they, if their parents have schizophrenia, if they have schizophrenia. I'm going to be looking at okay, that's a high heritability. Um, they have their family is bipolar disorder, like their parents. It's a medium heritability. If it's depression, it's it's a lower lower end or anxiety. Uh, but I want to formulate my plan while I'm talking to them, while I'm typing, and hopefully I can formulate a good enough plan. And once I get all that information, I'll write my impression of the patient. So I'll say the patient is a 27-year-old female who presents with signs and symptoms of depression and anxiety who may benefit from, so you always, I always say may benefit from starting Zoloft to better treat her depressive symptoms versus starting an adjunct therapy. And then I would t talk about therapy. Hopefully I can refer them to a therapist if possible. Um, and with diagnosis, diagnoses, you know, you, you write your diagnosis, but you want to let them know that it's a, it's a working diagnosis. I write this little, I have this macro about diagnosis. It says, the diagnosis of psychiatric illness is a complex integration of history, psychiatric and medical physical findings, social and developmental histories, history of substance abuse, as well as the mental status exam. These have all been considered in formulating the final resolved diagnosis, but this may change as more information comes to light. So it's, it's never permanent for them. You know, you want to let them know that while you have something like this right now, it, it's not always permanent. And after that, you develop your plan, get their pharmacy uh, information if you're going to prescribe them something, some of the medications. And one other thing is when you're going to prescribe like a controlled substance, we have a thing called CRISP here in Maryland. And when I use CRISP, I can look at any controlled substances they've been on in the past. And when I look at that, I can kind of see if they've been on stimulants or benzos, pain medications, and I want to know, do they, have they been getting it before? Uh, make sure they're not abusing it, for one. 
and, and it's something that I always look at right before I see my patient because that's that's a very big factor and that is how I do my initial assessment now let's talk about labs so I actually always get a baseline lab uh, assessment on all my patients and I want to make sure that their their bodies in homeostasis yeah, there's so many different things. They, they could have an MHTFR gene mutation and they can't metabolize folate. And if that happens, then they're going to be depressed. You know, they, have, they could have low testosterone. They could have a low thyroid, uh, hormone levels. You know, are they anemic? Do they have, you know, poor magnesium levels? There's so many things, guys, like uh, that, that labs can kind of help you get a better understanding of the patient. You know, medically, do they ever have they ever had a brain injury, tumor, stroke? You need to understand the whole picture, guys. I can't stress that enough. Medications, while they can help, there's so many things they, they could use. They could need a therapist. Do they have a therapist? Are they willing? I always say medications are the left shoe, therapy is the right shoe, and. You know, not using one or the other sometimes can reduce the chances of having a better prognosis. You need to look at you know, medications, you know, they help for the most part, but they have so many side effects. You have to look at exercise, nutrition. Sometimes patients might not even respond well to medications. You need to look at TMS therapy, intranasal ketamine. You need to research a lot of these alternative therapies as well. You need to understand the whole picture. All right, guys, the second P, out.